Uh, so my name is Greg Lyons. I am a software engineer at Box, where I work on our internal platform for deploying services with Kubernetes. And today I'm going to talk about our continuous delivery model on that platform. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Box, we are a cloud content management platform, which means that we make it easy for companies and organizations to store all of their content securely in the cloud, access it from anywhere, uh, share and collaborate so that our customers can you know, work together and do their work as effectively as possible. So to take a quick look at what Kubernetes looks like at Box, we're currently running four clusters, three of which are in production. Um, those clusters are running on bare metal in our own data centers provisioned with Puppet, uh, but we're in the process of rolling out AWS and Azure production clusters as well. To give a sense of some of the tooling that we're using um, to support our clusters, we're using Tigera's Project Calico for networking, uh, we're using SmartStack by Airbnb for service discovery, and we're using HashCorp's Vault for secrets management. At this point, we have about 80 services running in production, which really represents a pretty significant chunk of our core mission critical code that powers Box. Um, so at this point, we are pretty heavily reliant on Kubernetes and our services running on Kubernetes to power our product for the over 80,000 organizations around the world that depend on us. So given that context, um, when we need to make changes to our services that are running in Kubernetes, we want to do so in a way that's safe. Um, we're very much in the business of not breaking things for our customers. Um, I'd imagine many of you are in that same business as well. So that's what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, the problem of how can we make changes to our services running on Kubernetes in a way that's safe and easy. So when I say changes to a service running on Kubernetes, I could be talking about a bunch of different things. I might be talking about a change to a source code. If you have an app written in, say, Go or Java, um, you're adding a new feature. This might be a change to some sort of third-party package that you're pulling in. You might upgrade a version of some RPM that you're pulling down from the internet. This might be some config parameters like an environment variable or a command line flag. Um, and I'm going to stop there, but really the list could keep going on. It's not even close to an exhaustive list. The point is there are many different types of changes we might need to make to our service at any point, and we really do care about all of them. Because the reality is that any of these changes, if not rolled out properly, have the possibility to cause a lot of damage. So historically at Box, um, we've had some poor change control processes within certain systems um, that have led to some real serious problems. Someone's making a change that they think is pretty innocuous, that ends up either not doing exactly what they intended it to do, or it ends up affecting a lot more of the system than they expected at the time. Um, suddenly the whole site is down. So that may sound familiar to some of you. Um, you're not alone, but there is hope and there are some things we can do better to avoid that. So with our services that we're running now on Kubernetes, we're really trying to do things the right way. So when I talk about the right way, what do I mean? There are a couple of key principles I want to highlight first um, that are guiding our whole change control process. First one is that we want our change rollouts to be incremental. So that means that we roll out our changes a little bit at a time um, so that if something is going to break, we only break it for a small subset of our system instead of crippling our whole system at once. So what does that look like for us in practice? Well. Most of you are probably familiar with, you know, we have a production environment that handles our live traffic, and before we make our changes all the way to that production environment, we're going to roll it out through some intermediate environments. So we're first going to roll out to a dev environment, a staging environment, and a production environment. But that's not even the whole story. Within each of those environments, we also roll out incrementally. Um, so we do a canary deployment, rolling out to a small subset of the instances in that environment. If things look good, then we'll do our main deployment that rolls out to the rest. So this whole incremental change control process um, really mitigates a lot of risk for us and reduces the chance that our bad changes are going to make it all the way out to our whole deployment and production. The next principle I want to talk about is automation. So that whole incremental workflow sounds great for risk mitigation, but it sounds pretty terrible if you're going to have to do all that yourself. No one wants to sit there and you know click a button, deploy to Dev Canary, sit there and babysit it, make sure everything's OK, OK, ready to deploy, click a button to deploy to your main deployment in Dev. Everything looks good. Click a button to deploy to staging. Click a button to deploy to prod. If you're sitting, gonna have to sit there and babysit your whole rollout process, that's probably your whole afternoon, maybe your whole day. Um, we wanna be software engineers, not monkeys pushing buttons. So we want as much of that to be automated as possible so that we can focus on real more important work. So what that looks like for us is between our start of our rollout process and our finish, we wanna have as much of that in the middle automated as possible. We're gonna have to have some sort of probably manual intervention in the beginning. Um, and we really don't want to be have to sitting and watching that whole process. Um, we want it, as much of it to take care of itself as possible. Another benefit that automation gets us is if we're minimizing the interface for our engineers to have manual interaction with the system, um, we're minimizing the risk of an, one of our engineers accidentally making a mistake, 
Um, fact is, there are some things that computers are better than us at. Uh, one of those is, you know, simple repeated processes. Um, a computer is much more likely to accidentally forget a step in the rollout process than you are. Last principle I want to highlight um, is that we want our change rollout process to be declarative. For, so for those of you who aren't familiar with declarative versus imperative models, um, in a declarative model, you make a change to a system by specifying a desired end state of the system. Where in an imperative model, you make a change by specifying a set of steps that you expect to achieve that desired state. Now, one of the benefits we get from a declarative model is that when we write out our desired system configuration, we can actually write that out as code and check it into version control. So that means we can have a versioned history of the, system, the state of our system at any point and the configuration we wrote to get to that state. So what that looks like for us in Kubernetes means that if we're running our, rolling out our app to Kubernetes, we're gonna need some Kubernetes API objects to make that work. So we might need a deployment to manage pods. We might need a service object to load balance across those pods. We may need a namespace to run our app in. We want all of those Kubernetes API objects to be defined declaratively. Um, some you've probably all seen JSON and YAML files that describe your app's config. Um, so what we actually do is we write all of those objects in one file that we call our app manifest. And we want this app manifest to be the source of truth for whatever our app looks like on the cluster at any given time. We're gonna check that app manifest into version control so that again, we have a version state of our cluster at any given time. So in order to make things a little bit more concrete, um, I'd like to introduce Kevin. So Kevin is a box engineer. Um, this is a real picture of him. He's actually here at KubeCon. He looks a little different now than he does in this picture. Um, Kevin is a box engineer on our storage team. So in that role, Kevin has written an app called Storage Service that basically serves to interface with our content layer. Kevin deploys that app on our Kubernetes clusters. And in this example, Kevin's gonna wanna roll out a change all the way to production. So to get a quick look at what our whole change lifecycle looks like, I'm gonna give this big diagram. Um, it's gonna be a little confusing at first because I'm gonna kind of breeze through it, but then I'm gonna go through each of the different components in depth, and we'll revisit it later. So if this whole first part doesn't make sense, hopefully it'll make sense by the end. So as you can see, we have a bunch of different clusters that we're running. We have a dev cluster, a staging cluster, and two production clusters, east and west. Um, this isn't exactly what our setup looks like, but it serves the purpose. Um, so as we said, we want there to be one minimal manual entry point for Kevin to roll out his changes. That entry point is gonna be his app repo. So this is where his source code lives, or his Docker file lives, some other config as well. We want really that to be the point where Kevin's gonna make his change and we're gonna start the rest of the rollout process. So when Kevin makes a commit to that app repo and pushes it, it's gonna kick off a Git hook that will trigger the start of a Jenkins pipeline. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Jenkins, it's an open source automation tool. It makes it really easy to do things like build, testing, and deploying. Um, Jenkins is really gonna be the driver of the whole rest of our automated rollout process. Uh, we're gonna kinda hand over the reins at this point. So as we said, we want our changes to be declarative, which means that if we wanna affect our storage service as it's running on our Kubernetes clusters, we're gonna to need to modify the actual manifest that describe what those apps look like, or what that app looks like. So in our system, we don't actually directly have our Jenkins pipeline modify that app, those app manifests. We actually have a layer of indirection here. We have a templating system. And the way that our templating system works is that our Jenkins pipeline is going to inject certain parameters into our templates. That's gonna generate what the actual final manifests look like. That'll make more sense in a sec when we look at it more in depth. But suffice to say for now that our Jenkins pipeline modifies some parameters in our templating system. That, and then our templates are written in JSON it which is a JSON templating language uh, that we find super useful. We're then gonna run the JSON at command line tool to regenerate our actual app manifests. So great, we've made our change all the way to our final declarative spec. We say this is what we want our app to, or what, this is what we want our app to look like on the cluster. The last gap that we have to bridge is how do we actually reflect those changes in the cluster. So we've actually built a service to handle this for us. Um, we call it KubeApplier and we've open sourced this as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about how KubeApplier works later, but for, for now, um, just know that KubeApplier serves the purpose of keeping that app manifest repo in sync with the actual state on the clusters. So to look at the app repo a little more in depth as the first component, um, we have our, our storage service as the root name. We have our source code. Um, Kevin's gonna have a Docker file as well. It describes how to package his app into a container image. And we have a Jenkins file. So Jenkins file is actually a really cool way to specify the steps that make up your Jenkins pipeline, and you can check that in alongside the rest of your code. So as we said, there are a lot of different types of changes that Kevin cares about, not just source code changes, not just changes to his Docker file. 
He may want to change some of his Kubernetes configuration as well. Maybe like he's running different amounts of replicas in different environments. Um, and as we said, we want this app repo to be sort of the single point for that. And our, our manifests live elsewhere, so how can Kevin modify those manifest changes? Well, we started rolling out a set of parameters that Kevin's able to modify from within his actual app repo. What that's gonna look like is they're gonna be based on our environment and the track, either main or canary. So in this example, little truncated version of our file, you can see within the dev environment and the canary deployment, um, we may only be running, running one replica that only needs four CPUs, but in one of our main production deployments, we may be running 20, 20 replicas um, that require more CPUs. So we want Kevin, again, to be able to make those changes to his app within the app repo and not really have to worry about the rest of the automated system. So as we said, when Kevin makes a change to this app, let's say in this example he's making a source code change, he gets it reviewed by his team, he's gonna make a commit, push it to his master branch, that's gonna kick off our Jenkins pipeline. So the first part of our Jenkins pipeline is a bunch of steps that I've bundled under pre-Kubernetes. Um, this is less interesting stuff for this talk, but I'll go through it quick. We're gonna run some tests and analysis for things like code quality, um, code coverage, run some unit tests, make sure it does what we expect it to do. We have some security checks as well. We're gonna build Kevin a new Docker image, so he's made a change to his source code. We're gonna need to roll out a new actual image of his app. We use Docker. Then we're gonna push that image up to Artifactory, which will be used for our container registry, but we really could use anything here. And then as I said, we're gonna start rolling out to our environments, so we now need to start pushing this image change out to our actual clusters. As I said, we're gonna roll out first to a dev environment, and within that dev environment, we're gonna do a canary deployment first. We're gonna have some automated testing and monitoring of that canary. If things look good. We're then gonna roll out to the rest of our instances on dev, do some testing and monitoring, make sure everything looks good. If everything's okay in dev, Jenkins is then gonna start rolling out to staging. And our staging rollout process is gonna be pretty much the same as our dev environment. We're gonna to deploy to Canary before we deploy to main. Finally, if everything looks good in staging, we're ready to roll out to production. Uh, but some of you astute audience members may have noticed that the title of this talk is continuous delivery, not continuous deployment. Um, so different people have different definitions, but for us, what that means, um, in a continuous deployment system, all changes are automatically rolled all the way out to production. Um, we're in a continuous delivery system, which is what we're using. Um, all changes are candidates to be rolled out to production, but aren't necessarily rolled out. Uh, they require some sort of manual approval. Um, so continuous deployment uh, requires you to have a guarantee with your, with your service owners that their code is ready to be rolled all the way out to production at any point. We don't currently have that, that guarantee with our service owners, but we'd like to get there. But for now, we require some manual approval to roll out to production. Um, right now, the main way that we have that implemented for our engineers is they'll get a Slack notification that says that their deployment is ready to roll out to production. Um, and they, then they can just click approve and then go back to whatever they were doing and Jenkins is gonna handle rolling out to prod. And again, our prod rollout process looks very similar to our dev and staging as well. So this whole process that makes up the Jenkins pipeline, as we said, is defined in a Jenkins file that lives in Kevin's app repo. Um, a lot of our pipelines for our different apps tend to look very similar because we want them to follow this whole incremental process. So in order to have everyone duplicating the same exact Jenkins file, we've actually written a Jenkins pipeline library internally that basically allows people to reuse some of these common steps like deploying to a certain environment um, as building blocks so they can get up and running pretty quickly. So I very much glossed over the actual deployment mechanism. Um, thus far, I've pretty much just said, okay, we deploy to Canary and deploy to main, so now we're gonna look at what that deployment mechanism actually looks like. Um, as I hinted at, it has something to do with templates and manifests, so I'm gonna try to make that a little more clear. So if we work backwards, um, we have Kevin's app deployed in a bunch of different environments, dev, staging, production, and there's gonna be some configuration that differs across those different environments. So for example, like as I showed in that example, we might have different replica counts um, in our different environments. So that means we're gonna need different app manifests um, for each of those environments. We're gonna need dev one, staging one, prod one. These are all written in JSON. Um, but a lot of that config is gonna be shared and duplicated. Um, and we don't wanna have to have Kevin write that same config every time. So what he's gonna do is instead we're gonna write a template that's able to kind of centralize a lot of that shared config and we're able to actually inject parameters into that config, or in, into that template. So as you saw earlier, I had that set of parameters like the replicas, CPUs, so these parameters here are gonna be a superset of those ones that exist in Kevin's own repo. So these are gonna be pretty much everything that differs across environments, because there may be some things that he can't even control from his repo that we want Jenkins to be able to modify. So as it, 
I'll explain in a sec when I get back to Jenkins, but for now we write our app template and we inject some parameters that generate the actual state that results in the manifests. We also have a lot of config that's shared not only across environments within an app, we also have a lot of config that's shared across our different apps. So many of our apps run SmartStack as a sidecar for service discovery, and that sidecar config looks very similar for a lot of our apps. So we've actually moved that out into a shared library, so our templates are able to reference those shared libraries and our service engineers don't have to write that same code every time. So that whole template system um, kind of makes up the, the left half of, <laughs> of this setup. What our Jenkins pipeline is gonna do, say for example, we're rolling out a new image tag and we're rolling it out to the dev canary environment and track. Jenkins pipeline is going to write the new image tag into our parameters um, for that environment. And then Jenkins is going to run our JSONnet commands, taking the template and the parameters as input and is going to regenerate all of our actual manifest files. So now that the parameter has been changed that's being injected, our dev app.json manifest will now have the new image tag. So to make all this work, we actually put all of this under one big repo. We have one big repo called deployment config. You can see is divided into three main subsections. Uh, we have an apps section. This is gonna be where our templates live. Um, so pretty much the left side of this. We have under our storage service section, we have our app.json it, which is our template. And then we have the parameters that are injected. We have a library section that's gonna have things like the shared sidecar code. Um, so we have, as you can see, we have a smart stack libsonnet template. Libsonnet is just a um, convention within JSONnet that for shared library code that's only imported, you wanna have that um, with a libsonnet extension. Doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, and then finally, we have our release subdirectory, and this release subdirectory is what's gonna have all the actual app manifests that are generated. So we don't wanna modify those manually, we just want them to be regenerated based on whatever is specified in the templates and the parameters injected into those templates. So this release directory really serves as the whole state of our system, and we want that to reflect what's on the cluster at any given time. So one thing we get from having these all in one repo is that when we make a change, that change, um, we can see both the change that was made to the parameters that were injected on the templating side, and we can see what it actually resulted in the change to the cluster state. So if you look at the bottom, the files that were modified here, I hope people can kind of see that, but we've modified both the parameters file under the storage service section of apps, so we've modified a parameter that was injected, and that's also resulted in our app manifest being modified under release. So our commit history in this repo is gonna have the changes that were actually written by Jenkins and how it actually affected the cluster. And we also have some links to source code change and the Jenkins build associated with this change. So now that we've modified our manifests, again, we want those to reflect the actual state on the cluster. How does that work? Well, as I said, we've written a service called Cubeapplier to help us do that. So the way Cubeapplier works is it runs on the, our cluster just like any other service. So as you can see here, we have an API server, we have Cubeapplier, we have our storage service, and I've also thrown in a couple other example services that we run, upload proxy and download proxy. So each of these services we wanna have defined by a declarative app manifest that lives under deployment config. And the way that Cubeapplier works is Cubeapplier is going to continuously pull that repo for changes. Um, and if Cubeapplier sees that there has been a change to one of the files, for example, storage service now has a new image tag, Cubeapplier is going to run a kubectl apply command to the API server. So for those of you who aren't familiar with kubectl apply, it's basically the single declarative operator that says, here's what I want my object to look like in this file, and the API server will handle, handle making it a reality. So if we've updated our image tag, API server will handle rolling out the actual new version of storage service with the new image tag. So I mentioned that Cubeapplier is continuously pulling for changes, but we also have it running on a loop so that even if nothing changes, there's been no commits to deployment config, we have Cubeapplier run, um, do a full run through all of the app manifests under the repo. Um, every X number of minutes, we do something like 10 or 20, um, depending on our environment. But essentially what that gives us is a guarantee that whatever is actually in the repo is whatever is the state of the cluster at a given time. So if someone goes in and, for example, manually modifies one of their deployments in the cluster, they might use the kubectl scale command, change the number of replicas to be different from what's defined in their app manifest. We always want the app manifest to be the source of truth, so kubeapplier, even though no changes have been made, it'll periodically run through that whole thing, and it'll, 
overwrite the manual change that was made and resynchronize the state of the system with the actual, with the repo. So again, this gives us a better guarantee that whatever's in the repo is a real version history of whatever the state of our system is. Again, Cubeapplier is also an open source project. Um, it's available on GitHub, so I'll have some links at the end to that if other people might find it useful as well. Um, it really allows us to kind of abstract away this process and we get to use sort of the repo as our real interface for interacting with the cluster and not have to worry about actually manually running those kubectl apply commands themselves. Um, some of you might be, I'll, I'll get to questions at the end, um, happy to talk more after. Um, some of you might be more familiar with like push sort of models where like, you know, you may, when you make a change, your CI is just gonna run the kubectl apply command itself. Um, as I said, one of the things we like about this model is that it gives us kind of a, a stronger guarantee that whatever's actually in the repo is whatever's actually in the cluster at a given time because we're, we're continuously looping through and ensuring it's synchronized even if no changes have been made. All right. So to zoom out for a little bit, um, we have each of our clusters is going to be running its own instance of kubeapplier. Each of those instances is gonna be looking at a specific subdirectory within our release that within our release directory that has, again, all of the app manifests for that specific environment. So one of the really cool things that this gets us is that if, for example, we have a outage in one of our whole clusters, so one of our production clusters goes down, we have a versioned history of the entire state of the system at any point, so we can easily spin up another cluster to replace it, run a new instance of kubeapplier and point it at the same directory we were using before and we can spin up all of our apps exactly as they existed before. So when you don't really have a centralized, a centralized um, store of your state at any time, say each of their apps only roll out with their own pipeline and apply their own manifests, your cluster goes down, it can be hard to make sure you kick off all of the pipelines to bring up their instances exactly as they were. So again, this is, gives us a pretty good disaster recovery model for that sort of thing. So to zoom back again, back to our, what our change lifecycle looks like, hopefully it'll make a little more sense now. Um, we have our app repo where we want to make our changes. It's going to kick off a Jenkins pipeline that's going to handle rolling out to our different environments. We're going to roll out to those different environments by modifying parameters injected into our templates. Then going to use our templates to regenerate the actual app manifests that describe what we want our cluster to look like. And then kubeapplier is going to handle making sure that those app manifests are a reality in the cluster. So as a challenge to this model, I want to introduce Joe. Joe is also here at KubeCon. Joe is a box engineer on our service discovery team. So Joe, as I mentioned, a lot of our apps run SmartStack as a sidecar. So Joe actually deploys that sidecar shared library. And suppose Joe has to make a change to all of our apps running in production. Say, you know, there's a vulnerability in some version of HA proxy or something, and he needs to roll that out within our SmartStack shared library everywhere at once. So if each of our apps have their own pipeline that they're using to deploy to these different environments, how can Joe make sure that he can roll out a sidecar change in the shared library to all of those changes at once? Um, so in our current system, as I said, we have everything centralized under that deployment config repo, so we still do have an entry point for Joe to essentially make his change in that centralized shared library that everyone pulls from. And then Joe can have his own pipeline that actually regenerates everyone else's JSON files, regenerates their app manifest to pick up his change, and he can roll out all their apps for them. We don't really love that system because um, it kind of takes away the control from the service owner themselves. Um, if they're expecting that all their changes are being rolled out through their pipeline and they're modifying that, suddenly we're deploying their service without their knowledge. Um, they might not have any record that the fact that their last time their, their service was deployed is different from whatever they have in their pipeline history. So what we'd really like to do is have our app owners actually able to kick off all of their pipelines when we need to make a change and roll that change out through their pipeline. That's going to require us to be doing continuous deployment. So we want Joe to make a change to that shared library and then have a big red button where he can kick off everyone's pipelines all at once so that they pick up the change. They have their own history of that deployment in their own pipeline. Um, so that's one reason we'd like to get to continuous deployment is so that we can roll out all changes to all the apps all the way to production at once. So to sum up some of the benefits we've seen from this change control process, we have a greatly reduced risk of production outages. Um, so because we're rolling out things incrementally, it's a lot, a lot decreased risk that something that's bad is going to make its way all the way out to our main production deployment and cause some real problems. 
Uh, because we have a version history of the state of our system at any point, we have a really good audit trail for when we need to debug things or roll back, um, or someone makes a change that ends up affecting the whole system, we can kind of roll back our entire state to whatever it was before then. We've increased our engineering productivity uh, because our engineers can focus on more important problems than just sitting and babysitting their deployments, waiting for it to roll out all day. Um, if we do require manual intervention, um, we have it come up in an easy way that, where you can get back to doing whatever you were doing. Lastly, our engineers have greater confidence in making changes, so changes can be scary, um, but if we give them a process that makes them feel confident in deploying their code, um, we want our engineers to feel innovative and feel like they're able to make some changes and build some cool things. So that's all I've got. Um, I've got a couple links here if you want to read some more about um, some of the blog posts we've written on this topic. Um, and we're also going to be working on some more content, blog posts, and an open source repo as well um, to kind of make a more practical example of what this looks like outside of Box. So that, I'm happy to open it up to any questions that people have. Yep. So the question was about services that have state in running in Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't come across something like that. Uh, we aren't running our databases um, in Kubernetes yet. Hopefully we will. What he means is you have, if you have a schema change for an application that you're running in Kubernetes, you don't have to run your database to end up with an incompatible deployment of your application. Right. Got it. So you're saying a change to your schema somewhere else ends up affecting your Kubernetes cluster. You, you've got to coordinate the rollout of that schema change to the database mm -hmm. at the same time that you're deploying your application. Yeah. I don't have a great example for that specific case, um, but there are some similar cases that we have tried to solve. So for example, um, say you're changing an environment variable that's used by your service in your source code. You're going to need to make that change both in your source code and you're also going to need to change the environment variable that's passed in in the Kubernetes config. That's one of the reasons we're trying to bring those parameters into the app repo so that we can actually do an atomic commit that changes both the source code and the environment variable that's passed in. Um, as far as a change to a database schema that we don't really have any insight into in our Kubernetes config, that one's pretty tough. Um, I don't think we have a I have a great answer for that in our current framework, um, but happy to talk more after about it. Thank you. you had your hand up earlier, so. Mm -hmm. So when so if someone makes a manual change to one of our services running in our cluster, um, so we do have some access control so that we, we can limit what people can change, but if someone does make a change to something they do have access to, um, we do have some auditing in place as far as like kubectl commands that are being run in the cluster. Um, we have logs of that available. Um, again, for the most part, we'd like things to be rolled out through our declarative process, um, but we have tried to we do have some auditing in place. You know, you can't catch everything, you can't stop everything. Best you can do sometimes just have a record of what was done. Yep. So a uh, configuration question. Is, do you do all of your configuration through the smart stack sidecar, or do you do config maps and secrets in Kubernetes? Uh, for the smart stack sidecar specifically, um, we do use no, config. I was just saying for all of your applications. I mean, if your application accesses some storage mechanism or a database, you have mm -hmm. to give it a username and password, you have to inject those things in. Yep, we do, we do have config maps, um, we do have secrets. Secrets are kind of a tough one to roll out with this process and that you don't really want to specify um, your you know, secrets declaratively in a file as they're exactly expected to look. Um, we, do, we were doing some work on an encrypted secrets project um, that we kind of lost track on but hopefully can get back on board and maybe open source. Um, essentially we want you to be able to declaratively specify your secrets in a way that's safe. For now, our secrets are largely configured manually, um, but we do have config maps as well that we're using. So, yeah, does that answer your question? So what, what role does SmartStack play in that? So SmartStack, um, we use as our sort of service discovery mechanism of like which services need to talk to which other services. Um, SmartStack, we use some config maps to pass in the information that it needs, um, but our SmartStack config is also um, as, this, as I said, there's some code that's shared, but um, each of the apps are gonna have some things that differ among their, so our, our smart stack shared library isn't just like a drop-in 
function that, that does everything for you. You're gonna need to pass in some information about which other services you need to talk to. It just kind of abstracts away some of the shared code. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I'm happy to talk more afterwards about it. Yep. So the question was, can Kevin or Joe modify their Jenkins files so that they can deploy directly to production? Um, so we do have some um, restrictions on our actual Jenkins machines as far as like which, or we do have some restrictions within our Jenkins infrastructure as far as like what you're doing and like you can't just have, we don't want you to have a Jenkins file that can just arbitrarily do whatever steps it wants. That's one of the reasons why we really focus on having that pipeline library that kind of gives people building blocks that they can use um, if, I don't know if you're talking about like a malicious case or like an accidental case. Again, we wanna try to limit the accidental cases um, where people are doing something that they shouldn't be doing. We wanna make it easy for them to just kind of follow a process we've laid out. Um, So as far as like, what's, what's the alternative model that you're thinking of? So say you could have like a dev stage prod east, prod west branches that are all protected, mm -hmm. GitHub or GitLab or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you would merge changes into those separate branches. Is there a reason why you went for the file system model? Is it easier to, for people to explore, or I guess, what would make that work? Why was that choice? Um, there's not really, I don't really have a great answer for that. Um, I don't think there's a way that we've leaned strongly one way or the other. Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. I can, can try to find out more if you're curious. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, have you lost over time? Yeah, sorry, so the, the question there was, um, why do we have our multiple environments specified within, sorry, dis distinct within a file system, um, like as subdirectories, I think, versus having different branches, like a branching model where we have a dev branch and a staging branch, um, I don't have a great answer for that. Um, I was not part of that historical choice. Yep. Are, are, are the access model you kind of glossed over adequate to answer my question, but do you have to deal with any other separation of work compliance or other purposes in your CD pipeline? Um, so our access model I did very much gloss over essentially the way we implemented it a while back when there wasn't a lot of, you know, we've been running Kubernetes for about three years now since like 0 0.11, so some of these changes are historical changes based on um, the way Kubernetes was in early states and we haven't totally caught up in some ways. So our access model right now is we essentially are deploying all of our apps to their own namespace um, and we're able to control the access of which, which groups have access to which namespaces. Um, so as far as compliance, um, we try to match those, uh, the groups that have access to certain namespaces with an LDAP system that we have. Um, and so we want to ensure that um, you know, we have some sort of you know, production auditing system for who has access to what. Um, and again, we also, to, in order to make those changes, uh, to make changes to access control, we need to bounce the API server. Um, so that is gonna some, that's something that's gonna require um, the attention of our admins, so our admins are, are aware of every sort of permission change that has to flow through. Yep. So the question was, are we seeing the need to move our app manifests into our, the service repos? Um, this has been a, an ongoing battle for us. Um, we do like the idea of having our service owners able to manage their configuration alongside the rest of their code. Um, it does get a little dicey for some of the shared libraries um, and the things that we want to be able to generate from a centralized place. Um, so we want our smart stack developers to have some kind of centralized entry point that everyone um, pulls from, so that's why we've, we've started to pull out some of those parameters into the app repo without pulling the whole canonical source of truth manifest. Um, another thing we get from having all of those app manifests in one place is that's like our single source of truth of what the cluster looks like. If we have those kind of dispersed through all our different app repos across our system, um, again, we don't really have a clear picture of like what each app is running at any point. Um, so it's possible we might be able to just move the whole app manifest out to someone's repo. We'd still probably have a copy of it somewhere that has everything centralized and have that kind of be the canonical source of truth. It's, it's an ongoing debate for us. Um, that's, Pretty interesting, I didn't get to talk too much about here. Um, but yeah, again, we wanna make, we wanna give our service owners control over those config changes, but for now we kind of also like having that config all in one centralized place.
Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering um, how you address uh, potential differences between uh, the state that Cube Applier sees uh, and other components that can change uh, properties of, uh, of deployments, like a horizontal pod autoscaler. Yeah, so we so autoscaling is a good one that we haven't had to deal too much with. Um, and again, for the most part, we want things to be declarative when we can. Um, and we haven't really solved the autoscaling problem yet. Um, so that's going to be a tough one. Um, for the most part, we want to avoid people making manual changes when they can, but there are some things that we're going to have to solve. And there may even be some deficiencies kind of in the Cube API to support both this declarative workflow and things with the um, support changes to the declarative workflow and changes with things like autoscaling. Um, so we're going to kind of keep following the community efforts on that sort of thing um, and hopefully come up with a really good solution when we come across that problem. So I, sorry, out of time for more questions, um, but I'll be right outside um, if anyone wants to talk more. Um, thanks again, everyone, for coming. Hope you learned something, and uh, have a great rest of the conference.